Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Muddy Outdoors, Fuse Accessories, Frigid Forage, Trophy Rock, Scott Archery, Cabela's, Rocket Broadheads, Bloodsport Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Yeti Coolers, Quiet Cat, Non-Typical Wildlife Solutions, Deer Grow, and Nikon. Welcome to the first episode of the Midwest Whitetail Off-Season Series. We're going to run this series now all the way through uh, probably sometime around the middle of June. So keep checking back every Monday. And we're going to cover all kinds of topics, uh, stuff that we didn't have time to cover during the season. Also lots of off-season topics as well. We're going to be getting into shed hunting, uh, food plots, a lot of uh, efforts going to go into planning and planting uh, our food plots. So uh, keep checking back. But on this episode today, I'm going to talk about shot selection. And I'm going to go back over some of the hunts that we've had. Oh, it's been clear back to 2008 when we first started filming for Midwest Whitetail. We've got a collection of, of you know, obviously some good hits and then some stuff that are, you know, maybe a little bit more controversial. And I'll jump into that today. We also have a segment for you on a quick seg segment on rabbit hunting and then how to cook rabbits. Uh, so it's, you got one week left before the rabbit season is over here in Iowa. Hopefully this will give you some motivation. Uh, it sure looks good. It's Chef Aaron Neal at his best. So let's get into this, uh, this whole subject of shot selection. And the, the first thing I want to say about it has to do with the fact that there is no one size fits all. If you, if you think about the advice that you got when you first started bow hunting, I'm sure everybody said, okay, 20 yards and closer, broadside or quartering away. And that was the advice. And, and we all received that. Uh, the, the thing is, you got better as an archer your experience uh, grew, you had better knowledge of the anatomy of the deer, your equipment got more powerful, a lot of things started moving in your favor as you matured as a bow hunter, but yet there's still this kind of a standard that says these are the only shots that are acceptable for, uh, for bow hunting. And I'm not trying to, to, to discard that. I just want to throw a little bit of, of, a, of another thought in there, and that is the fact that in certain situations, if the skill level, the experience level, and the equipment allows, it opens up a few more shot opportunities. So let's talk first about the broadside and the quartering away shots. I mean, obviously these are the standard for bow hunting. Everybody likes to see this shot. The deer is stationary, uh, close range. You know he's close enough that he's not gonna be able to jump the string when you go to shoot. Uh, you know, it's, it's, that's what we all dream about. Unfortunately, we don't get that many shots like this. I mean, we dream about it, but in the real world, you know, they're, they're going to be uh, a percentage of the opportunities that we get. So then we have to decide, do we throw away these other opportunities and not take these shots? Or do we handle those shots a little bit differently? So if the deer is beyond 20 yards, really if it's beyond 25 yards, you run the risk of having some string jumping and the deer uh, will hear the sound of the, the bow going. It'll drop down to load its legs in order to bound off. And in so doing, the kill zone drops. If the deer is alert at 25 yards, 30 yards, 35 yards, uh, you need to aim low. And how low you aim depends a little bit on where you're hunting, what part of the country, how quick the deer are, the arrow speed that's coming out of your bow. Uh, but typically I say at 30 yards you need to aim for the bottom of the brisket and past 30 yards you have to aim off the bottom of the deer if the deer is alert. If the deer is not alert, I still aim low now. I aim for the heart on a 30 yard shot. I aim for the heart on a 40 yard shot. You know, you, you, you run that risk, of course, that um, the deer is still gonna drop, but hopefully it doesn't drop so much that you can't continue to get into the vitals uh, with the arrow. So that's the broadside and quartering away. Uh, the other shot that we're seeing a little bit more often now is the quartering toward shot. And we've gotten more successful on making this, and there's two different ways you can do it. One is to go right behind the front leg or almost hitting the, the the shoulder or the front leg on entry. Uh, the other option is to go in front of the shoulder blade and shoot them head on through the chest more. And there's a big disclaimer here. And I want to make sure that you, you get this uh, completely squared away. This is not a shot for everyone. 
you, you need to have a setup that's geared for maximum penetration because the difference between wounding this deer and killing this deer is how far your arrow goes into the deer. So if you're not shooting at least 70 pounds and you're shooting, let's say a conservative broadhead, one that doesn't open up real wide, you know, those really wide opening broadheads, they tend to slow down a little bit more inside the animal just because there's more resistance from those wide blades. Uh, if you're shooting heavier draw weight, conservative broadheads, and I can even go one step further and even say the smaller diameter arrow shafts, that helps with penetration too. This shot will work for you, but you really need to understand the anatomy of the deer. If you don't understand where the vital organs are inside the deer, then the shot isn't for you either. So those are the two qualifiers. You need to have the equipment and you need to have the understanding of the anatomy because you're really not aiming for an entry hole, you're aiming for an exit hole on the other side. And what you're trying to figure out is what are you gonna take on the way through? And it can't be one lung. It's going to have to be either two lungs or one lung in the liver or you know potentially you know one lung in the heart uh, but those are really the only acceptable outcomes uh, for a quartering toward shot if it's only going to take one lung uh, it's not acceptable so you need to understand the the anatomy of the deer well enough to know what that wound channel is going to look like as the arrow goes through the deer there's one more shot that's really going to tempt you and that's when the deer is really close to the base of the tree and you're going to be looking down at it saying, well, this thing's only five yards away. I should be able to hit exactly what I'm aiming for. But this is probably, I would say, the, almost the worst shot that you can take in bow hunting. Even though he's right there and you feel like you can totally control where the arrow hits, uh, if you miss those really small targets even a little bit, you're probably going to get a single lung hit. And single lung hits are bad because uh, they usually are fatal, but they're really difficult to recover. So most of the single lung hits are going to kill the deer. It's just going to take time and the deer is going to be able to cover a lot of ground. They're going to be able to stay on their feet for a long time and your chances of recovering that deer are a lot lower than almost anything else that you can do. So in that situation, what I recommend to people is let the deer go past. You know, if the trail is close or the deer is coming straight at you and you don't have a shot coming in, now he's right at the base of the tree, you really still don't have a shot. You need to stay with that deer and once it starts angling away from you, wait till it gets about 10 yards out and aim back far enough where you can get the liver and a lung on the entry. You always wanna get two vital organs, unless one of them is the heart. <laughs> Anytime that, that you shoot a deer, you always wanna to try to get two vital organs. So uh, that's my talk here on, on uh, shot selection. We brought you a lot of cutaways of deer that we've killed over the years with various types of shots. And, and uh, you know, again, I just wanna make sure that we get a really good precautionary note on this, that not every shot is for everyone. As your skill level develops and your knowledge develops, your ability to open up certain additional shots uh, continues to grow. But don't jump ahead of that curve. It's like anything else. You know, don't shoot farther than you're accurate and don't try to make shots that you're not capable of. All right, so now let's talk about rabbits. It's mid-February and uh, John and I are out today. We're gonna do a little bit of rabbit hunting. It's, uh, and we're also in the process, we're going to check out a new piece of public land, do a little bit of scouting. But uh, this is a great thing to do during the off season. You get to get out, shoot your gun a little bit, chase some rabbits, and uh, also learn a little bit about a new property. So we're going to get the guns um, and uh, put some miles on the boots. Hopefully by the end of the day we got some rabbits, know a little bit more about this property, and maybe even get some sheds. So we'll see. Right there. Right there. See him right to the right of the bigger tree.
just finished up our walk and as you can see we got a few rabbits. It was a lot of fun but we definitely missed more than we hit. Um, we, and we definitely learned a lot more about this property. You know we got some fresh snow on the ground right now so it's not that easy to see uh, the rut sign from this past fall. But this is a great thing to do during the off season. Like I said earlier, if you spent the fall in a deer stand and didn't have much action, um, you can get out and uh, this is definitely an action packed uh, type of hunting. Uh, as you can see, John and I are just using 22s. Uh, this is a Ruger 1022, it's a semi-auto and uh, it makes for real nice, easy follow-up shots. Um, but the reason we like to use a 22 rather than a, a 12 gauge or you know any kind of shotgun is because you can really uh, do more meat damage at, with a shotgun than you will these 22s. Um, it is a lot more of a challenge, especially when you got rabbits running on the, on the move. But uh, if you can sneak up on them when they're still sitting there, it makes for a pretty easy target. So a few of the other things we like to use are we always bring a backpack because if you get it, even if you only shoot two or three rabbits, it uh, gets cumbersome trying to fit them into pockets or something like that. These backpacks offer a lot of room. You can stack them up in there. And a uh, good pair of brush pants is definitely essential. When you're rabbit hunting, if you've done it before, you know that you're walking through some of the gnarliest stuff that the property has to offer, and that's what we did today. Um, and then the last thing, when you're covering a lot of ground like we did today, you want to have a good comfortable pair of uh, hiking boots, rubber boots, whatever your preference is. Definitely make sure they're going to be comfortable because you're going to be putting the miles on them. So, so with that being said, this is definitely one of our favorite off-season activities. You get to cover some ground that you don't during the deer season, and hopefully if we can get out a few more times, we'll have enough for a good meal. Well, they cleaned a couple of these rabbits up and threw them in here for me to cook while they went back out and do some more hunting. I guess they expect me to do all the work. <laughs> Today we're going to do a old recipe that my grandmother liked. It was a fried rabbit fricassee. Now what a fricassee is, is just fried meat cooked in a white gravy or a white sauce. The way we're going to do that is milk, shortening, some flour, I got a little mirepoix here, which is carrot, celery, onion. My grandma's secret ingredient, evaporated milk. Now I got one rabbit broke down already, sitting in the milk, soaking, and I'm gonna show you how to break down the other. First, spread him open, pop him, and you just fold the joints. After you get the back legs off, I'm going to go up here and right below the rib cage, I'm going to take this, pop it. Now you got the rib cage and the front shoulders. Pop it down there through the center. Take it. You're going to bust them ribs along the spine. Take your knife cleaver. You could even have shears if you want it. Pop it down through there. One, two, three, four. That there's my mama's favorite piece, the back meat. Now if you try to grab that out of the pile at my mama's house, you might as well lose a finger. Get six pieces out of a rabbit. Now that we got it cut up, we're gonna soak it in our milk. Usually let that soak about an hour, just kinda draws some of the blood out. You can do it overnight, doesn't matter. We're gonna get our electric skillet going. It's pretty hot now, so I'm going to go ahead and add some shortening to it. Just need enough to cover the bottom pan and do some frying with. Not too much. Ho! Oh! Now that our pan's hot, we're going to go ahead and batter these babies up and fry them. Now, if you want them extra crispy, do this twice. Got a milk and egg whites in here. Kind of helps the batter stick a little bit or flour. Dump them in there. We've got a few pieces floured up here. You, what you do next is you kind of shake the excess off and you lay it right down in hot grease. Oh, baby. Now we're not going to mess with this now we got them in there for a minute. We're just going to let them cook. We're trying to get that golden brown and delicious, that GB and D. Flip it over, do the same thing on the other side, probably four to five minutes. If it ain't quite done, just leave them down there a little longer. <laughs> now that we got all the rabbit fried up, we're going to get rid of our excess grease. Try to save them crusties if you can. They're good. 
It'll leave all that suck in the bottom now. If you've seen any of my shows, that's all flavor, baby. Now we're going to put our... Wrap it back in. Before we get the pan completely full of rabbit, I'm going to go ahead and throw some of this Mirapol in here. Freshen it up a little. Just kind of cook it there in the center. Let that cook down a little bit. Sure is smelling good. <laughs> now that our Mirapol's cooked down a little, we're going to go ahead and cover it up with some more rabbit. Come in with your evaporated milk. You're gonna want enough of this to come all the way almost to the top of it. That was just about four cups of evaporated milk. You're gonna go ahead and turn your skillet or whatever you're using. You can do this in a Dutch oven on a fire or on the stove, whatever. I got an electric skillet here, so I gotta turn it up. Now that we got it to a pretty rigorous boil, we're going to reduce the heat, let it come down to a simmer. We're talking about 300 probably. And we're going to go ahead and put the lid on. Now at this point, all you got to do is hurry up and wait. Let her just sit in there and simmer. Probably take an hour or so for the sauce to thicken up and your meat to get tender. It'll be falling off the bone. I'll be back in an hour. <laughs> This has been on for about an hour now. We're going to go ahead and plate it up and see what it tastes like. A couple big old pieces here. Got a hind quarter. Where's that back at? Mama ain't here, so I'm going to slide in there and slip one of her backs out. Piece of back meat right there. Get some of this stuff. Kind of drill it on there. Mm. That brings back a lot of memories hunting and cooking rabbits with grandma. Till next time, I'm Chef Aaron Neal. This is Rabbit Fricassee. Good luck and good hunting. Thanks for joining us this week. Next week, we're going to get into the little bit more hardcore shed hunting. We got a lot of snow on the ground here yet, but it's supposed to be really warm uh, over the next few days, melt away a lot of this snow. So we should be able to get out and start looking for antlers. We'll bring you some of that action. Hopefully we can find some of these bucks that we were uh, seeing last year, some of the deer that we got uh, trail cam pictures of, and start figuring out a little bit more about the ranges where these deer are living. That's the one thing that's really nice about shed hunting. You know, people like the antler, but really you can learn a lot about that deer too by getting out there and finding those antlers because that's going to reflect where the deer spent the winter which in a lot of cases is pretty close to where that deer's core area is. So uh, we'll have that, we'll have more scouting tips and uh, I'm sure we'll find some more stuff to talk about next week. So come back and join us again. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail and remember to always dream big.